morning, Miss O'Day. We welcome you to this morning's Sunday digital service. As we begin to worship together, wherever you're at, I just want to encourage you to, to sing out. Let's make much of Jesus together. Hey, well, again, welcome to our on-demand online service. It's a shared service across all Missio Day. My name is David. I'm one of the pastors at Missio Day Humboldt Park, and I'm grateful that you have come to worship and to receive uh, from the Word this morning. Today, we're going to be concluding our series entitled Kingdom Citizens, and believe it or not, it has been our fourth shared series. It's been a long season, but this particular series for us was an important one because of our cultural moment and navigating the tension and dynamic of our faith and also the political landscape that we find ourselves in. Today I'm going to be preaching on ending tribalism once and for all. It's going to be a message on the Holy Spirit, so get ready for that. 
But as we looked at this series, we just had a, a great awareness of the heightened season of life that we find ourselves in. We are navigating a year of conflict, of COVID, a year of contention, and we found that so many people, not only within Missio Day, but within our own city, so many people are filled with anxiety. So many people are overwhelmed. Many people are filled with, with resentment or anger. And part of that is because 2020 wasn't supposed to go down like this. 2020 was supposed to be a year of, of heightened vision. It was a year when we are, are to celebrate the progression of, of our country or the progression of, of our even city. And we found that the vision that we received was far more difficult, far harder than we anticipated. And what we've learned is that, that we haven't arrived. What we've learned is that we're not as far along the road as we would like to think we should be or would be. What we've learned is there is so much work still to be done. And so in the midst of this moment, we wanted to call our church to uh, an alternative uh, way of being. We wanted our, our church to be an alternative uh, community where, where it's more than lip service when we say that we are called to fix our gaze on Jesus. But Jesus, who is the author and the perfecter of our faith. Jesus, who is the basis of our everlasting hope. Jesus, who is the one who not only all things were created in, through, for, and by, but the one who holds all things together. The one who is reconciling all things to himself in heaven and on earth. And Jesus, as Colossians says, who is making peace through the blood of the cross. So make no mistake, in the midst of this year and in this moment, we are calling you to set your gaze upon Jesus, to set it fixed upon heaven, have hearts fixed on heaven, while remaining firmly rooted in the earth. To pray as Jesus taught us to pray, to a holy and good Father, and that the will of the Father would be done not only in heaven, but here on, on earth as well. This is the call for us in this, in this community because as Brian talked about last week, there are many who are celebrating, dancing in the streets, and there's many who are grieving and lamenting. In record numbers, it has polarized the experience of our world and certainly politically as well. And so for the follower of Jesus, would we be a foundational community and a community that calls down heaven here on earth? I love what Melissa said uh, the other week that we are to be reminded as Christ followers who we reflect in this world. Be reminded that not only are we an alternative community, but we're a display community as well. She quoted Hauerwas in Resident Aliens and saying this, from a Christian point of view, the world needs the church, not to help the world run more smoothly or to make the world a better or safer place for Christians to live in. Rather, the world needs a church because without the church, the world does not know who it is. What a statement. Without the church, the world does not know who it is. For the only way the world to know that it is being redeemed is for the church to point to the Redeemer by being a redeemed people. The way of the world is no, the way the world knows that it needs redeeming that is broken, that is fallen, is for the church to enable the world to strike hard against something which is an alternative to what the world offers. We are a redeemed people, a display community. And that's a hard word right there. If we could just stop for, for one second, I was getting all preachy as I read the quote, and just to say this, like that statement and the words that I'm preaching in large part do not uh, compute with broad mainline Christianity. The, the world is having a more and more negative view of the church because it would say, we don't like what you are selling. We don't like what you are displaying. That's where now one comes down and saying, you, you can't display redemption and hope for the world if that's not happening in your life. If the ethics of the kingdom of God, the way of Jesus are not modeled in your life, then maybe rethink the platform that we are promoting and, and, and maybe not put a, a, a Christian spin on it. Let's just be honest. But the world does need a vision that is beyond itself. See, a world that we live in is a world filled with division and with fear. And Christians are called to live to the bigger picture, to be an alternative 
community that lives that alternative picture and longing for God's will to be done on earth as it is in heaven, regardless of, of our circumstances or who is in office. John Tyson in Promise of Another World wrote that our approach to the world should be with humble conviction. He quotes Karl Barth by saying, the church exists to set up in the world a new sign which is radically dissimilar to the world's own manner and which contradicts it in a way that is filled with promise. So not only do we, do we display what the kingdom of God is and looks like and who Jesus is, but we should be doing so in a way that is filled with promise, that's filled with hope, that's filled with life, that is, that is other than and contrary to the experiences around us. Now, over the past two months, we've, we've tried to do that by, by talking about big things that will form our imagination for the kingdom of God. Dave Van Winkle started with talking about Jesus as Lord as the basis for us as citizens of the kingdom of God. We talked about Jesus' own politic. We talked about biblical nonviolent resistance. We talked about power and how to, how to endure the misuse of it and how to use it for its proper use. We talked about not being demonizing fools, but faithfully loving citizens focused on the real tangible need around us. We talked about how to navigate division and disagreement and, and daily interaction and communication with others. Uh, Brian yesterday talked about what does the world need the church to be right now? So the civil engagement. And then today, we can't have any sort of compartments or tribalism within the Christian camp. And that is all those who profess Jesus as Lord. And for us to do that, we have to lean into the Holy Spirit. So the power that we draw from in light of the cross and in the era of the Holy Spirit will be the thing that ends tribalism. Now, I've got a bunch of scripture for you. Uh, and so, I, you know, it's not like let's exegete one particular topic. Uh, I just want to launch from this Holy Spirit verse in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. When Paul says, don't you realize that all of you together are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God lives in in you. This is a, a fulfillment of what was prophesied in Joel 2 that said, I will pour out my spirit upon all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. In those days, I will pour out my spirit, even on servants, male and, and female alike. I will pour out my spirit on all, all people. What a vision that we have for the church. And then in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, later on, Paul says, some of us are Jews and some are Gentiles. Some are slaves, some are free, but we all have been baptized into one body and of one spirit, and we all share of the same spirit. Some of your translations might say we drink of the same spirit. You think about Jesus when he said, from you will flow torrents of, of living water. From you will be a great outpour of everlasting life from the Spirit. Now, we have to do the work when we are, we're engaging in life or when we're engaging in Scripture of not being autonomous when we do that. There's no such thing as autonomous Christians. We are called together to be of one accord. And that's why when we kind of try to make shift a Christian faith to, to be fine-tuned for ourselves, somehow devoid of life together, submission to one another, it doesn't have the lasting effect that we would hope for it to be. When we cut ourselves off from the people of God, we usually wither. We usually aren't experiencing that torrent of living, of living water. So we all drink of the same spirit. Now, I think the church provides a unique vision unlike any other community uh, that exists in the world. Firstly, as I've already read from 1 Corinthians chapter 3, that we are a place where God dwells. Not only does God dwell with us, but where we go, we usher in the presence of God. You want to talk about a redemptive edge to anything that we do, Think about your vocation of your work. Some of us work in really hard places, difficult places. When you go to work, you are ushering in the very presence of God because the Spirit of God lives in you and in us collectively. But I also think about like brick and mortar. I think about the church buildings. This church building, for example, if you go into the staff office, you'll see a big banner and it says a century of God's faithfulness. 
For over, I think, 150 years, this place has been a monument to the dwelling place of God. People want to encounter God, or when people are struggling and need the presence of God, they know that this is a community where the presence of God can be found. That's a unique vision that only the church uh, can have. Now, Jesus, before the ascension, after the resurrection, he had said, all authority, all power in heaven and earth has been given to me, and now I am sending you, go and make disciples, baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teach them to obey all that I commanded of of you. Go and, and take courage of heart, because I'm with you until the end of the age. And so we find that the presence of God is a, is a going dynamic. It's an expansive dynamic. And so I love that, 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 we can, that we can bring salt and light wherever it is that we are. And that's part of ushering in the kingdom of God. Now, life with Jesus must give way to life in the Holy Spirit. And this, I believe, is the second unique vision of the church. And that unique vision is radical inclusivity. Now, radical inclusivity is not easy. It's not a slogan. It's not something you put in your Instagram story. It is marked by grit and scrappiness and a life lived to that statement being true. Radical inclusivity. This is a unique vision of the church. I think anywhere else, if you don't get on board, then you get uh, out-counseled, maybe. That's that's a term that that I recently learned. You know, like if you have people that are bothering you, just out-counsel them. Maybe I can find a better, uh, more grumpy group of people for you to hang out with. The unique vision of the church, though, is that, that all are brought. Again, the Spirit of God is poured out upon all people. Some of us, as Paul said, are Jews. Some are Gentiles. Some are slaves. Some are free. Uh, some of us are, are men. Some are women. But the Spirit of God has bound us all, for we are of one body, and we drink of one spirit. Uh, the Reverend Dr. Willie Jennings uh, wrote in his commentary in the book of Acts, and if you haven't read The Christian Imagination, that has nothing to do with this particular passage, but you need to take the month that it'll take you to read that book and read it. Very, very uh, important as we think about the ministry of of, uh, joining. The spirit is the spirit of joining. But he writes this, when Jesus ascended and when he called his disciples to wait for the promised Holy Spirit, Uh, the new wine that was poured out on those uh, that were unaware of just how deeply they thirsted. Their deep need, they didn't even know their deep need until it was poured out on them. I think about, and I'm just going to take a little bit of liberty with my time here, but in the story of of Everest into thin air, uh, there are these mountaineers that are stuck on Everest, and they were able to get a radio transmission to them, and, 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 and they were talking to, to one, and he was just saying how, how desperately he needed oxygen. And there were other uh, mountaineers, other climbers that had said, we have a stash of, of tanks that are right by you. Can you find them? And he grabs them, and they're tanks that are filled to the full with oxygen. But because of his confusion being on the mountain, his lack of oxygen, he couldn't even tell that they uh, were what he desperately needed. And he radios down, these are empty, these are empty. And they're saying, no, we just put them there. What you desperately need is in your hands. This is kind of what Jennings is getting after. That the new wine that was poured out on those just desperately unaware how deeply they thirsted. So Jesus calls them to wait. Wait for the promised Holy Spirit to pray. And so they gathered to pray. They asked for power. They may have asked for the Holy Spirit to come. They may have asked for power in grace. But the real grace that was coming was an untamed grace. It's a grace that replaces our fantasies of power over people with God's fantasy for desire for people. For God has come to them, on them, and with them. Jennings writes, the spirit of God creates joining. The followers of Jesus are are now being connected in a way that joins them to other people. In the most intimate space, in the most intimate voice, memory, sound, body, land, and place, the Spirit creates joining. The same Spirit that was there from the beginning, that was hovering, that was brooding in the joy of creation of the universe and each of us individually, knows us together and knows us separately in fullness. This Spirit has announced an intention that will make us once again vessels of glory, speaking out of who God is that's lived out in who we are together. 
See, this type of work of the Holy Spirit, and if we're going to say Jesus come soon, and we're going to call upon the Holy Spirit, then it will be seen in how we live together and how we live with one another. This same Spirit, this same Spirit is at work in us as it was in Pentecost. Now, Jennings writes that to love our neighbor and to be about the justice work that the Spirit forces us into, it has a spiritual dimension as well. It will be a love that builds directly out of the resurrected body of Jesus. It will be a love, as Karl Barth says, goes into the far country. And this love cannot be tamed. It cannot be controlled. It cannot be planned. Once it's unleashed, it will drive us as disciples forward with one guiding question. And that question is, where is the Holy Spirit taking us? And into whose lives is it taking us? There's a, a years ago, I preached a sermon and, on the Spirit and I had read something somewhere that I cannot find. I've tried to find this source. I can't find it. So just know that going into it. But it was about the uh, Scottish evangelist. I'm pretty sure it's the Scots. Maybe I Ireland. Again, I found it. The story is still strong. But it said that they would prepare ships. And they would commission people out. And they would, we would, they would go into the open sea and say, wherever the Spirit would lead us, there we will go. And there's a level of dependence there that I just absolutely love. Whether that's in power or whether that's perish, there, is a, there was a purpose and trust in the spirit of the living God. And that's the faith that I want. The faith that I want is dependent upon and, and deepened by the, the blowing of the spirit, the leadership of the spirit, the movement of the spirit. And listen, I get it. We all talk about those things but then they match up against our plans or they match up against our uh, other things that create like, like concern or are more important to us. But the spirit of God that leads uh, then also leads us today. So that guiding question of where is the spirit taking us and into whose lives is it taking us? One more quote and then a scripture reading and then I will, uh, I will conclude our sermon for today. But uh, Kierkegaard said this, Love is expression of the one who loves, not of the one who is loved. So those who think that they can love people they prefer do not love at all. For love discovers truths about individuals that others simply cannot see. If we think we can love only those who we prefer, if we can, if we can be invested in only rhythms and only community that we 100% agree with, then that's not love and that's not community at all. That's just a form of, of autonomy and self-worship. See, love discovers truths about individuals that we cannot see. So to close our series on kingdom citizens and to prepare us for Advent, I have Ephesians chapter 4, verse 3, and this is a call that I would give to you. Make every effort to keep yourself united in the Spirit. Bind yourselves together with peace. For there is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one glorious hope for the future. For there is one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all, in all, and living through all. Has this lockdown just started and we are settling in for at least 30 days, maybe two months, into the new year, make every effort to keep yourself united in the spirit. And that looks like connection, and that looks like community, and that looks like intent, but it also looks like laboring in love over the spiritual things. Pray for those in your community. Pray for those in your family. Pray for this community and church to continue to be a testament to God's goodness and love and presence. And would you pray for blessing and peace? Let's pray. God, thank you so much for this season. Thank you so much for this community. I pray that you would tangibly uh, touch every life and every heart, every uh, move and direction towards you in these dark and difficult times. Would it be counted as holy and worship? And would you find us in those spaces? Lord, we love you. We thank you. It's in your name we pray this in all things. Amen and amen. I did.
Thank you for joining us on our final Sunday on our series, Kingdom Citizens. I hope that this series has challenged you to move beyond your political ideologies and to live a life that is deeply connected by a revolutionary love that surpasses all understanding. So as we close, please receive this benediction. Let the message about Christ in all its richness fill your lives. Teach and counsel each other with all the wisdom he gives. Sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs to God with thankful hearts. And whatever you do or say, do it as a representative of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father. Go in peace.